So journalists are highly resilient. They're used to dealing with challenging situations, stress, emotionally complex topics. But online harassment isn't just criticism, it's abuse and it can be systematic and sustained. So it raises a different kind of challenge. Even that said, most journalists will respond well and find really good coping methods. But as a community, we need to be aware uh, that there are possible mental health risks and understand more clearly what those are. So there are two principal tracks. The first is to do with material that's clearly traumatic. That's material that contains threats of death, uh, traumatic imagery, um, threats to rape or sexual assault. And the reason this stuff can bite is that it engages our kind of natural self-defense systems, exactly the same natural self-defense systems that get engaged when we have to confront those issues in real life. And they, the issues that arise from that can include elevated levels of hyperarousal, feeling on edge, or a kind of sort of numbed out kind of spaciness, the reverse process in which we feel, you know, maybe a bit detached and overly, not in a positive way, but detached in the sense that it's kind of hard to access our emotions. There are all sorts of reactions and responses. And if the threat is sustained um, large enough, and particularly if it's credible and there's a real reason to believe um, that there's a possibility of real attack, people can um, get themselves into trauma trouble. Um, this can take the form of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, uh, and other things as well, things like substance abuse, destructive behavior. So that applies mostly to material that's obviously directly threatening. And here, context can be a real issue as well. So there's a big difference between receiving threats uh, in a relatively safe environment than receiving them uh, in a place where they're much more credible. So for example, if you're working in the Philippines and you're reporting on Duterte's so-called drug war, uh, your daily working pattern might be interviewing the families of the bereaved, you could be out there counting dead bodies, you could be in a place where the gap between online threat and threat in real life is much, much closer. And so that's obviously likely to increase the trauma loading. That said, even in safe environments, we mustn't kind of minimize the risk and pretend that just because these things re rarely happen, just because violence online rarely uh, transfers into real world violence, we shouldn't minimize the, the risks or the perception of threat. One of the things, distinguishing features of online threats is that we have very poor knowledge of who the perpetrator is. And in the mind, when you can't see who's uh, threatening you, it's very easy for the, the image of the attacker to kind of grow bigger and bigger and bigger and take up more thinking space. Another aspect of this is that the threats um, come into our domestic lives. You know, people have computers in their homes. Um, I heard stories of people who've been at their children's parties and then receiving uh, online threats or even traumatic imagery on their mobile phones as they're playing with their children. So obviously this material can have an impact. The second main dimension is more to do with the negative loading of the material. So the material needn't be particularly traumatic and the may not even contain direct threats, but it's, it's more to do with abuse, belittling the journalist, and making ad hominem attacks, uh, suggesting that they don't know what they're talking about, and the, grunt, the general negativity uh, that we often find in online comments below the line uh, and in comments that are added onto Twitter and Facebook feeds. The issue there isn't so much to do with trauma, but more to do with something we might call, kind of think of as the kind of negative cascade effect. And that is that when we're confronted with negative material, or we start thinking negatively about stuff because that's the material that's impinging upon us, the next thought that we reach for is more likely to also be negative. Okay? It's a, something to do with the way that the brain categorizes uh, experiences and thoughts. And it tends to tag negative ones together along with positive ones together. So if you're thinking about something negative, the next thought you reach for is more likely to be something negative. Now, of course, we're journalists uh, working in the world. We expect to come across negative material. But if that negative material reaches such a volume 
um, that it's harder to kind of put into perspective. We may find ourselves kind of cascading and sort of tipping down into a, an increasing pattern of negative thinking. This is a particular problem for online moderators working in newspapers in which that's what they do. You know, they're sitting in a chair and they may have to go through material of which 60 to 70 percent in some way represents unappealing, unappealing aspects of humanity. So there's a danger that that might encroach into their personal thinking space. Um, often people may find themselves going home late in the evening and kind of feeling that they're useless and that they, you know, that they can't get anything right. And all this kind of negative self-talk. Uh, it's quite possible that that negative self-talk is actually coming from the work that they're doing uh, rather than from anything in their own personal lives. So another question here is also the personal location of the journalist. So the intent of somebody who's a true nefarious troll is to silence the journalist and what they will do is pick up on any features that they can find that they think might in some way discredit or destabilise. And so they often use the personal context of a reporter against them, and it could be their gender. Uh, often attacks are sexualized in ways, to, in ways that imply sexual assault, or again, belittle women because of perceived sexual differences. Um, and it also can kind of pick up on issues to do with the community. So it's not um, unusual for there to be references to lynching or to attacks that um, refer to the collective trauma of somebody who comes from an ethnic minority. Um, trolls do this kind of stuff because they know that it works. So we have to be very careful to understand um, that these techniques that they use are real techniques and they're exactly the same kinds of techniques that people in abusive relationships use um, for coercion and control within those relationships and they've been adapted um, by people to silence journalists. So we need to think about online harassment in some ways as being similar to real world abuse. And I think we can learn a lot in the media um, from groups who've had to deal with those things, people who've faced intimidation and directly abusive uh, con you know, behavior in real life. So that would be victims of real world bullying, victims of sexual assault, victims of gender-based violence. All of those insights into kind of dealing with abuse also have a relevance within journalism, even if they're the situations are different.